Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Um, Phoebe Fisher is going to be giving her completion seminar today, which is based on her own personal research that she's been doing for the past few months. She's been a graduate attache with us since July, having come from SOAS, where she got her undergrad in social anthropology. And she has worked in Zanzibar, done some archaeological research there, and today her work will be what you'll be discussing will be uh, titled, We Don't Need to Have a Kenyan Sound, The Negotiation of Ethnic and National Identity Through Traditional Music in Contemporary Nairobi. It's, it's long, but it's good. <laughs> Just don't worry. But anyway, so what we will do is Phoebe will speak for about 30 to 45 minutes, and then we'll open up the floor for questions, which all of you guys can ask, and we'll continue the discussion that way. Karibu sana, Phoebe. Thank you. And when she says questions, so that's also comments. And I mean, this is this as a, a graduate attaché here. It's this is me sort of beginning my research, and maybe it's more like a, a sort of a survey of what's out there in Nairobi. And so, if you have anything to add, anything to that you think we could debate a little bit, that would be really helpful. Thank you. So this is my music, uh, my recent my music, my research. Um, it was I was sort of beginning to think about it uh, as how people encounter traditional music in their lives here in Nairobi. And that became, when I began talking to people about it, they be began to use it, it's, this word's traditional, oops, um, as how to refer to, do you want a hand? How to refer to the, their, um, a way to sort of negotiate their ethnic and um, and national identities as well, especially um, this is sort of topical around election time. And so when you're talking to people, that's kind of what they brought up in terms of what they were, they wanted to talk about as well. So that's sort of where my research ended up going. Um, so my, okay, I'll just wait. So, okay, I'll just continue then. So why I, partly why I was interested in this research is I'd come from an, an internship in Tanzania where I was working with the Cultural Arts Center, um, looking at how, or helping with a documentation project on traditional music there, but also working with some artists who describe their music as fusion. So working with traditional music there. Oh, okay. Um, working with the, working with el elders as well from the villages and then turning that music into something that they can put on a stage and then using other instruments as well, electronic instruments and taking it to big festivals such as Saiti Zabusara in Zanzibar. So this, it's something that I've been working with artists there and I was interested to see how people do that here in Nairobi as well. Um, in terms of my, like my research questions, I was interested more explicitly in how well, how people encounter traditional music, but then how they begin to use that in their contemporary music here in um, Nairobi. And then also how they use it to negotiate their ethnic and national identity, as I said, that's how people sort of began to refer to it themselves. And then also, of course, how, who's the audience for this music? Because as much as you can be producing something, negotiating your own identity, it's sort of always a, a discussion between the artists and the audience and people who are listening in the spaces in which they're playing this music as well. Um, yeah, I'll say again, it was a very broad research. It was, it was more like when you was following a snowball effect, so was, um, talk to one artist and they say, oh, you should talk to this artist and this artist. And so part of that meant that it was in some ways quite narrow and partly that's to do with my own positionality as a researcher as well. Like the spaces where I sort of ended up, especially initially listening to music for places like the Alchemist, Good and Art Centre, um, the Alliance Francaise, and they have a very particular group, a select group of artists in them, and then that's somewhere. And so that's, those are the sort of people who I ended up interviewing and talking to, and that's something that I would very much like to, to explore other areas of where music and where people are talking about these tra traditional elements in their music as well in different places. Um, but in total, I did, I did 14 interviews with artists, with ethnomusicologists, with people running documentation projects, like places like the, um, the Presidential Music Commission over by State House. Um, and then I also went, I attended the Kenyan National Music Festivals as well. So that was in July in Kakamega. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah. Oh, a, a little word, like a, a sort of qualification. I was, um, 
I'm using this word traditional, and I'm aware of how that's problematic. It's when you're using that word, it's often associated with something that's reified and something in the, his, in the past. And of course, it's reenacted and renegotiated here and today. But I mean, I had this conversation with Gahibi. Like every word that you're going to be using is going to be problematic with using indigenous, ethnic. So it's something that she uses is cultural because that's something. So one of the artists that she's working with has suggested, and because that's it's much more dynamic and something that's maybe more associated with the present, but I've decided actually to stick with traditional because it's something that like all of the artists that I talk to, they refer to themselves, although they have like different ideas of what it means. It's they were also when they're using that word, I felt like they were also referring to something that was in history and in past and something that they can sort of roots their like ethnic identity and national identity around. And so that's why I've sort of stuck with but remember it's always in these inverted commas and you have to sort of um, bear in that bear that in mind. Um, in terms of structure, did I make a slide? Can't quite remember. I think it's like, yeah, structure of my talk. So I'm going to begin with like a little quick little history, just to contextualise like what music is doing here in Nairobi at the moment. Um, then I'm going to look at some of the government institutions which are facilitating people's access to traditional music today. So that's um, like the permanent presidential music commission, um, and then also like the national music festivals, and these are sort of connected to how people are taught music in universities with like the lecturers also um, being adjudicators at the festivals and teachers for the students there. Um, then I'm going to look at this idea of the, the crisis of um, Kenyan identity, particularly in music, which is something that like when I started talking to people, they talked about this is some like debates that has happened. And so people were all sort of talking about that. And so I thought that's something that I have to address. And then I'm going to use a little example of um, sampling um, traditional sounds in people's house that's mostly in electronic house music so people take uh, um, like a, a sample a clip of music from supposedly from a village somewhere and then put it with like a heavy electronic beats and use it in a club and then um, and then I'm going to come and look at the audience for where most of this music and this is something that I would like to bear in mind all the way throughout it's like a lot of these other musicians who I'm um, talking about for m many of them their music is listened to by upper middle class people in Nairobi and also many expats and that's so the audience who I found there at the um, like the Alliance Francaise and the Alchemist and that's who they talked about is the people who were mostly attending their performances as well. Okay. So begin with a little bit of history. So I thought I would begin with Benga and Benga is not really um, associated or I've not really explored Benga in my music in my research because it's it's not really what people refer to when they're talking about traditional music. But I thought, because it's, it has a huge impact on a lot of the music that people are producing here in Kenya today, and it's also, as one of my, the people I talked to, they say, Benga became like a tradition in itself. And somebody else says, Benga is like, I can say it is the Kenyan brand. So it's talking about this, it's from sort of 1960s, 19, sort of around that kind of time. Um, and that was a lot of the music that was heard, and even up to today, like if you're sitting in Matatu or you to go to particular places in Nairobi, the benga is what you hear. So I'm going to play you a little clip. So this is Joseph Camaro. He's um, one of the like most prominent Kikuyu Benga artists. So So that is that's a little example of Benga. Um, as you can see, it's I mean, well, I'll play you some other things later, which people are incorporating this this traditional music, and this it sounds all these influences are there. Um, it's it's not really what people are talking about. Um, 
So Benga itself, it's um, sort of arose in the, like the, around the 1960s and a little bit before. Um, a lot it has like heavy influences from other music around um, Africa as well, especially like Lingala music from the Congo, um, and especially incorporate um, especially associated with the Luo people here in in Kenya, where they the Nyatiti players from the Luo community would took up a guitar and then sort of transferred some of the music and some ways of styles of playing from the Nyatiti onto the guitar and sort of created this this benga. But of course, as well as the Luo community, you have other bengas from different other communities as well. So you have Kikuyu benga, like we heard just heard some of, like which Mugidi is kind of a, a sub benga. Um, and then you also have like Kamba benga as well from. And so actually, ah, sort of annoyingly, I I contacted um, one of the the Kamba benga artists, Kenwa Maria, and he only got back to me. Yeah, two days ago saying, oh, we, we can talk, but unfortunately I didn't have enough time to talk with him, but maybe in the future when I come back to continue my research. Um, yeah, so that's, that's Benga, um, which I think is important to contextualize. And then the next thing that happened was President Moy, and I have a picture of him here with his guitar, because President Moy was a huge fan of music, um, but especially traditional music, and so he's a big fan of, the, he set up the Permanent Presidential Music Commission, which is, is, has now become just like a department um, of music, but um, they, have, they have their music um, documentation project, as well as they have some facilities for people to um, be able to, like studios to record. Um, but also he's a big fan of the Kenyan National Music Festivals, which was in itself was not set up by him. It's actually got like older roots in like, from like colonial time. Um, but he was big in like facilitating musicians to to like to access that, put some like a lot of government money into it so people can travel to it and open up to the rest of the country. And also he's as he's in charge of sort of every um, function and every celebrations or national celebration we insisted that there's music at every graduation there's music at every function um, but these are all from so and so yes great on the one hand he's sort of facilitating a lot of music but it was very a very narrow sort of music he has like ultimate control over everything you cannot um, veer away at all from his values of love peace and unity of his um, his presidency but also praising him and like in a very narrow idea of this is what he wants, and nothing can be critical, nothing can be saying anything that is sort of away from his party line at all. And so you have access to this traditional music, which is sort of associated with the old, depoliticized nation building, but at the same time you have no contemporary musical expression, you have, or maybe not no, but very limited um, contemporary musical expression, and it's like very sort of rigid um, society, which doesn't allow for any of that. And so a number of the musicians who I talked to described this period as like a, a, like a period where people lost their sense of, of music, lost their sense of identity in music, and instead listened to just a lot of foreign music, which is actually something that continues to today. Like when you listen to the, the radio, you hear all the, the American top 40, you hear music from the Congo, you hear music from South Africa, but you don't actually hear that much Kenyan music, um, unless you hear Benga, actually, but it depends what radio station you listen to, of course. Um, and so I read somewhere, in fact, by Mboya Wandolu. They described it, in fact, as a nation-building project based on Congolese music instead of as Kenyan music, which I thought was an interesting thing to say, as something that it was um, depoliticized, and so they're borrowing music from uh, outside of Kenya as a way to build up the nation under his presidency. Whereas, and so but after Moy has gone out, um, now I heard it described as one of the, the people who I talked to as a renaissance of music and music scene here in Nairobi in which there is so much musical expression going on. There's a whole range of genres, different styles, different genres, everything from electronic house to punk to rock to more benga but, and everything in sort of different, different new ways of expressing it and critical lyrics and it's much more open. And so now is a time when actually people are beginning to express themselves more in terms of music. Mm. Although, and this is where, where, I, where I'm going now, is there's still, at least especially in traditional music, you still have the role of the government. So, for example, in um, influencing it, for example, you have at the Kenya National Mas Music Festivals, and then you have, um, like, the Presidential Music Commission who decide who is, who, which artists are supposed to be playing at every function. For example, 
um, I was talking to them around Mashuja Day, and they were sort of programming which artists they want to get there. And they'd, um, the, the person I was talking to was saying that they'd had artists complaining because they wanted a transcript of everything they were going to say and everything they were going to sing beforehand. And if they veered from the scripts at all, they would just like cut the mics, and so nobody could have like be critical at all. And that's even existing today. So that's still very sanitized, and that's something you get from the government. But in terms of the Kenyan music festivals, so the Kenyan music festivals, I went to the National Music Festival, but for the people who don't know, it's like a series of like music competitions, which starts at like a school level, and then, I can't remember exactly the, is it district, and then, I don't know, county, county and district, and then all the way up to the National Music Festival, which happens once a year, and you have hundreds and hundreds of different classes from, um, like set songs, some of which are like classic Western classical, some of them are, you have poetry readings and, um, what do you call it, and recitals, and then you've got big choir, comp a lot of it is like big choirs, and then you also have like cultural and traditional dancers, I have a picture of you, some kids here. Um, um, yeah, so uh, I was talking to somebody from Kayamba, Africa, and he described that's his, like, his introduction to traditional music and described quite a typical experience from what it sounded like from other people is that they would, be, they would have like a hat and they would all take a piece of paper out and then that would be the, the ethnic group that they would represent in their music. So he was like, remember fondly from all those years ago, so he was supposed to do Somali music. And so he had to go and do his research about Somali music and so that was what he was going to perform. Um, in terms of where they learn about the music as well, from the teachers that, that I talked to there and also the people at the PPMC, like that's, the PPMC record all of the music and all of the performances there and then it all goes into their archive there. So they get teachers coming to listen to the music and the past performances there. Um, so that's how they learn and how they teach their students for the upcoming years about how they should perform and they, so they listen to what the adjudicators have said, for example. And what I was, something I was surprised to see and I don't know why I was surprised, but so I um, discovered that, so for a lot of like the cultural and traditional dancers, you would have one soloist who was often from the ethnic group that they were dancing or singing from, and then, but the rest of the dancers and singers were not, like they were just from a mix of different places around, and it's what happens when you've got a one school that's representing, and so you've got a mix of different people and you just pick the people with the, the best voices. And an exception of that actually was um, the the Maasai, and so I was, when I was watching like, the Maasai dance class and they were mixed with the Sambur, the person I was sitting next to, he was like, those are real Maasai, those are not. Those are real Maasai, those are not. And so that's him, so apparently it's the real Maasai who always win that, even if they're, they're Sambur in that class as well, because their dance is not as sensational there. Um, and something that's particular, I guess, about the Maasai is what, how people described it to me, is that because it's a, it's a living trend, a tradition, like people are often, they're doing this in their villages as well. They're not just learning it in school like a lot of the rest of the, the dances that people were doing. Um, yeah, but so it's, so it's like a mix of people doing all their different dances and representing like all of the, the um, different people around Kenya. Um, so I've talked to different people and they have a number of criticisms about this. Um, partly it's because of this learning from past performances that inaccuracies creep in. And it's partly because of um, the, so the, in some cases, the adjudicator will pick the performance that it, to win, the performance that is the most sensational instead of the performance that's maybe the most accurate. And because ultimately it is a performance on a stage. And in a similar way, the dances, many of the dances are choreographed and so like you have what I was, I was struck by they all kind of look the same like you have one from every culture in Kenya and every everyone is proud of their different cultures and everyone's talking about how it's so amazing that we have this multiculturalism but at the same time they all look kind of the same you've got this semicircle of people who all do these sort of unified dance moves and they all wear all in their exactly wearing exactly the same like you can see them all there and they're matching kangas with their cardboard swords and so it's um it, that is okay. Um, it's okay that it's choreographed for a stage, and of course you couldn't just bring villagers and put them on a stage. It would be boring, and the songs wouldn't work there. But um, at the same time, people were talking about this. These are the traditions of Kenya, and this is the way that young people are like learning about the different traditions of Kenya. And so it's it's this form that is being built up for the stage rather than um, something that exists sort of more symbolically with the culture itself. So I mean, it's like I have no problem with it being something here and it's, but it's maybe something that should be acknowledged more. Um, 
yeah, especially when this is, people talking about this is the way that we are preserving culture is in this kind of form. Um, the other thing that's, uh, so I've heard some criticisms of, is that people would pick inappropriate songs, for example, like circumcision songs or um, like funeral songs, which should never really be performed on a stage, but instead, but they pick it because maybe because it fits like aesthetically with the other songs. Um, and an example of this, another example of this, which is a sort of a slight digression, is from the Kayamba Africa. So I've got a little tune to play for you from Kayamba Africa. Well, well, that loads. Okay. So this this tune that I'm about to play for you is, um, and I was t I talked to the people at Kayamba Africa, and they're like, oh yeah, this this tune that we borrowed, that we got. Oh, sorry, got that. Is um is from it's a it's a funeral song. Sorry, just ignore the advert. <laughs> um, it's a a funeral song which we. Um, we thought it sounded, too, it was too boring and too slow, so we thought that we would put a catchy beat to it. So So that's sort of like a little digression, but that's uh, maybe a sort of an extreme example of that happening. So you have some just take music, take music, and because it just make sort of like take the, the aesthetics of it without any of the context, without any of the sort of the background understanding of what's going on or understanding the language even. And so we put it on the stage, and it's just performance, so, so you can win. Um, so I'm being very critical of this at the moment, but on the other hand, when I was sitting there, and so I attended some of the classes of people playing different instruments as well, and I would say, oh, so what's that instrument? And like everybody around me always knew what all the instruments were. They could say where, which community it came from, they could say like which particular songs that would, they would be played for, and the, the different ceremonies. And, I mean, and so I was amazed at this, like, this knowledge that people had as well. And so that's something that a, a, few, a music festival like this is, is really important in like, continuing that kind of knowledge for people. Huh. Okay. So it's, yeah, so as much as I'm critical of uh, sort of like the, the changing form, the decontextualization, maybe these sort of make it just take the aesthetics and sort of leave out some of the context. Like, actually, this is, has been like a really important way in, of like, teaching like all of the school, maybe not all the school kids, but at least all of the school kids who perform, and there's thousands and thousands of kids every year, about what these different instruments are and about all the different communities in, around Kenya as well. And so I was very impressed by that, actually. Um, and then the other thing that I found interesting was because, so the way people talked about is not, um, uh, this sort of the, these mixing of ethnicities is, it's not necessarily people who know the language who are actually singing the song, it's not people who have ever been anywhere near anyone who's actually performing music or, or dance like this. Um, but they talk about, so, People, somebody leant, leant over to me and said, see, see all the cultures in, in Kenya, and so see how we can love each other and perform each other's songs. Tribalism is something that only exists in politics. It's not something that actually exists here for, for us people. And so that, I guess, is, it's also, I mean, it's continuing this nationalist project of bringing everybody together, and so, but in this kind of depoliticized, de, like, almost detribalized way, and so you have everybody coming together and we can share and learn from each other. So I was also very impressed. I don't want to be too critical. Um, well, move on to um, 
how people this this discussion of the, the crisis of Kenyan identity. So this is less in terms of like the actual traditional music in terms of how it's packaged there in the in the music festivals, but in but actually more about how people are doing it in in their contemporary music here in Nairobi. So this this picture here is this is Irosh, who is um, looking very contemporary in that picture. Mm. So when I first began talking to people, they, they talked about how they were struggling to find this, this Kenyan sound. And it's been this discussion that people had been having um, amongst themselves and huge debates, apparently hundreds and hundreds of Facebook comments about how they were trying to find this Kenyan sound. And I, as far as I could gather, it was that they were concerned that, so like if you go to Angola, you know that they have their Kaduru music. And in Congo, they've got Lingala. And in Tanzania, they have bongo flavor. And in South Africa, they have a particular sound as well. And so whereas in Kenya, they didn't have a particular sound like that. And people, a lot of people put it down to the, the Moyer when people didn't have this sort of space for creative expression. Um, and then so nothing had really moved on from Benga. Um, but, or at least in like sort of urban contemporary music. Um, but then the conclusion which they had all come from, and I heard this from sort of different people, and so it seemed like a debate that had happened, and then they had all come to this conclusion, is that they didn't want a unified Kenyan sound. There's, yeah, there is no unified sound, and we don't want one anyway. And actually, so different people said different things, like Irish said, um, the Kenyan sound is just what comes out. And what somebody else said is, so, I mean, like, why would we want one? Like, where would the, the punk rocker, where would he fit into that Kenyan sound? Like, the, it's so nice to have this, like, this multiplicity of different types of music. But at the same time, many of the different people who I talked to were using this idea, or like this traditional music in their music. Like, they would talk about the particular rhythms that they would use from the different communities in Kenya, or they would talk about or in house music, which I'm going to look at next, is them like explicitly sampling music, which is sort of tribal or traditional. And actually, this is almost like a little aside. Oh no! First, uh, uh, and like an example of that is Tetu Shani. So, he's—I was talking to him anyway, just for because I met him like randomly. But he's saying that his next album, which is coming up, he describes it as Chakuti. So that's um, a mixture of Chakachi rhythms from the Swahili people on the coast and Isikuti um, rhythms from the the Luya community in the west. And so he, and for him. He actually, who hasn't grown up here in Kenya, so he describes it. So he is um, best placed actually as a, like an ex, not an expat, but like a third culture kid to sort of take different parts. And as a percussionist, these were the, the rhythms which had moved him most. And so I thought that was really interesting. So he wants to root himself in Kenya, having come back to Kenya and is developing his music. And so he sort of listened to, listened to all the, you can see with your singing wells, he listened to all the singing wells music videos and he concluded that these were the ones that he wanted to incorporate in his music. Um, um, yeah. But, and actually, I mean, this is a criticism that, like, that Kehidi brought out for me, which I want to point out, is that, so this, this kind of, like, doing research on, on music as well, it's in the way he described it, and actually so other people have done it as well, but these... I've done it in similar ways by listening to YouTube or talking to their friends, and so we we all know what Chikacha sounds like. But actually, many people, when they're doing the research for it, don't haven't like gone out of the city to do like proper research for it. Just sort of rely on archives and um, other musicians. So it's maybe sort of reifies this idea of what these traditional musics are that they're using. Um, and actually, in particular, Chikacha is something I noticed like. It's like everybody who I talk to who so oh, you use traditional rhythms? Yes, we use ch chakacha, which I thought was something interesting. This will be my, my next re research project, is why does everyone want to use chakacha rhythms? And it's, it's interesting, because it's something that is quite heavily like, influenced to Tanzanian music as well. You have chakacha, and it's out there on the coast. And it's also in some ways interesting, because the coastal rhythms and the coast, there seems to be like a slight disconnect with like, sort of the cultures on the coast and what's happening here on Nairobi, and anyway, like different religion. Um, maybe more connections up and down the coast and with the Gulf and down to Tanzania than there is with like the west of Kenya. But for some reason, everyone used Jakachi. Like this is from like Sarabi to Saiti Sol to I don't know maybe not Irish, but yeah, different people. So that was something I found interesting. So and um, well, what that is, I guess, is just so everyone is using traditional music, but not everybody is using. We're not using all of the traditional musics from the whole of Kenya. Like there are so many different um, possible ones that you could use, but for some reason, Chikacha is just the most catchy. Um, yeah. But in terms of like identifying and identification with these 
um, and building negotiating identity with it. It's, people seem to have it on different scales. Like on the one hand, you have. Um, so I talked to Daniel Nyango, who most of you have probably seen. He he came to at the last, yeah, last and the one before our exhibitions to play as Nyatiti. So he himself is. So he says, I'm very much like openly like I'm Luo, but uh, no, I'm Luya, but I'm playing the Nyatiti, which is like a Luo instrument, and he's learning from a teacher who's Luo, and he's like learns the songs from the Luo community. But he describes his music as. Afro, well, not fusion really, but like African. He's he's like, I don't want to be limited to an ethnic group. I don't want to be limited to Kenya. So instead, we have like, like these shared cultures across Africa. So I will, he sort of orients himself as African. Whereas on the other hand, I talked to Sarabi, um, and they said their music is is very much Kenyan. So and they part of this is because they've toured a lot internationally, I think. And so I didn't put this quote up there, but what they said to me is, someone from Europe will call us Africans generalizing, and that has kind of got, got into some of our heads, whereby we can try and speak, we were like we play African music or something like that. You have to be very specific about what kind of African music you are playing, because Africa is a very big place. So for them, it's really important to, associate, to, to assert this like, Kenyanness in their music. They're not just sort of any old African, they are actually Kenyan. And then other people do it like in a more specific way. So Irish, for example, he is... Um, talks about himself as Kikuyu. He didn't talk about himself as Kenya or as African. He talks about just Kikuyu. And people, he rejects this idea of Afrofusion or this label of Afrofusion for his music because it's, it's not Afro. It doesn't represent all of Africa. He's playing Kikuyu music. And so I'm going to play... Oh, I'll, I'll play you a little clip of his just so you can hear some of it. Um, a, a little qualification about Irish. He should probably not have actually been included in my research, but I talked to him because I sort of was one of these trails that I was following. Um, but he, because he doesn't talk about his music as traditional either, he doesn't use this word traditional, and he said, so I asked him about it, would you ever associate your music with traditional? He says, no, 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 not at all, because it's, there's nothing traditional about it. So, so what is traditional? He says, oh, there's people that wear sheepskins when they're playing, or they just play their, their African drums. And he's like, I don't use traditional instruments, I don't speak in a traditional way, I'm not playing traditional music. And part of that, I think, is because he's, what he's playing is more banger than it is traditional in this sense of like something that's old and something from the village. Um, yeah, okay, so let me play you a little bit of that. Which maybe said something about how other people are, they're ha quite happy to use this word traditional without really problematizing it, which suggests that for them it's it's something that is connected with like, almost like prehistory of Kenya, and something that is, that's really old. It's just something that they can base their identity upon, especially if they're not connected to any village anywhere. Yeah. No. But basically, it sounds a bit more like Benga. But what he's doing with his music is he's playing older tunes and he has connections with like, vernacular musicians he, um, and people who play radio stations who have their own archives of things. And he's sort of learning tunes from them and also has spent time on his grandfather's farm and learned tunes from him as well. But he plays them all with electronic music or instruments and he sort of makes the beat a bit more catchy and plays it in a. Um, like in a very like contemporary setting, and so it's, the idea is to make it um, make make it more danceable, make it more accessible to people. And he also, yeah, I mean, I'll, hmm. um, yeah, another way that people sort of assert their identities or negotiate that as well is by language. And so this one I'll work sort of in backwards order that I did from the last one. So Irish, for example, he's, he only sings in Kikuyu. And he, or almost, almost always. Um, and so he described this as like part of his trying to retain part of the energy that was there in the music, which is something that is lost when you put it into a new um, 
a new context is the power of the Kikuyu singing to other Kikuyus and he sings like these old Mau Mau songs and he talks about how this, this sort of amazing energy of people who have lived through this and a community as well which has lived through this. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's music for everybody. He often shares his stage with, uh, inc like brings other artists onto his stage so that he can um, make it not just about Kikuyus but also just much more accessible to other people and also plays um, in a venue, which I guess I'll come to that later, but plays in a venue where a lot of the audience are expats as well. And so he, like, but he's like, no, I'm not going to translate my music, but sometimes he sort of explains what he's going to sing beforehand, or sometimes he's like, yeah, no, sometimes I lie so that I can laugh at the white people who don't understand what is going on. So, but for him, it's really important to be singing in Kikuyu, just to keep, keep that in the music. Whereas, um, so Daniel Nyango, who I mentioned earlier, who plays his Netiti, so he himself he is playing Luo music, so sometimes he sings in Luo if it's a song that he's learned from his teacher, but sometimes he sings in, in Luya, which is his mother tongue, sometimes in Swahili, sometimes in English, and he described this as the modern style of mixing languages. And I guess that's a very typical Nairobi thing, like you have so many different people who come from different places and using their different languages. And so that's something he reflects in his music. And then I talked to Sarabi, who said, no, we never talk in our, in our vernacular languages. We never sing in our vernacular languages because our music has a message that is relevant, relevant to everybody. So we only sing in, in Swahili or English or Sheng. So it's something that all of Kenya can understand. And we don't want to exclude any particular groups. And in fact, because they've played a lot internationally as well, it's partly why they sing quite a lot in English, or at least and then the bits of the Swahili are sort of sort of framed by bits in English so that everybody can access it. And, and he was like, yeah, because it's the same problems. They have quite a strong social activism message or messages in their music. And it's like, it's the same problems. You're from Scotland, right? So it'll be, yeah, I'm sure you have these same problems in Scotland as well. And so we're singing music that's relevant to you. Yeah, so that's, yeah, we have huge variation in how people negotiate that. But it's, everyone has something to say. It's very, very, and with all of this, it's like very carefully thought out. When you ask someone a question, it's still not like, hmm. It's like everyone has an idea of what they're doing with their identity, what they're doing with, especially with traditional music and sort of forming their identities with their music. And last one, like quickly, Irish as well. So he, it's not his real name. His real name is Irungu. I'm probably not saying that right, but it's a Kikuyu name. And so he, but he doesn't want to be initially, like upon reading his name, he didn't want to be identified as Kikuyu and put in that particular box, which I always found was quite interesting though, because he's only singing in Kikuyu and he's singing like very like, not nationalistic, but whatever you would call it with um, the equivalent with like an ethnic group, like songs which are designed at sort of building up this ethnic group. Um, yeah, but so a name is another way you can do it, so make yourself sort of ambiguous ethnically, or I guess, or to root yourself in a particular ethnic group. So we can... And then I wanted to have an, uh, a slide on Sauti, uh, Sauti Sol, who I didn't actually talk to, but I have a picture of them, they're all wearing their African prints and looking very African. Um, but because everybody mentioned Sauti Sol and pretty much university likes like, I was very I was very impressed actually by how they've managed it and found no criticisms of Sauti Sol um, let's see if we can play okay but this song that I was going to play you is, um, it's called Suriaku. And so they, this is the song that many people used for me as an example of how, how people have done it most successfully. They've taken rhythms or traditional rhythms um, and they've taken, even in the song, they've danced moves and shot a lot of it in, in villages at a wedding ceremony.
So that's it. So, so you can see you have, well, for maybe some people who have not seen that video. <laughs> Everyone, I think, has probably seen that video otherwise. But it's, um, so that's, people were particularly complimentary about them because of the way they've managed to incorporate those traditional elements into the music, which is somehow it's, but everybody listens to it. It's hugely popular, played on the radios everywhere. And actually in Tanzania, people were playing these songs, which is kind of unusual. Like most of what they play in is, seem to be Tanzanian tunes, but people like these ones as well. Um, and part of what they've managed is to not appear in their, while well, they've managed to incorporate traditional elements, they've, they've not been, they're not perceived as being sort of backwards for it. At the same time, they're very contemporary. They're very, everyone wants to be them. They're the richest musicians in, in, um, in Kenya. And so, so what piece, two people, different, different people concluded for me is that they've managed to, to market it, to, to package it. And so what this, um, trying to find this Kenyan sound, it's not actually about trying to figure out who people are. It's actually about how can they make money from it and how can they put it into the mainstream so they can be stand up against other artists like Nigerian artists or like um, these big superstar Congolese or Tanzanian artists who are using these traditional elements in their music but they're also being they're also successful as musicians in their own right not just as like world music uh, musicians sort of in their own category okay so that's it so so next I have um, uh, example of uh, like an example of another way of people are using traditional music, but this is in like a like really explicit way is how people sort of sample it in their own music. Mm -hmm. So this one would be. Okay, so, um, but what these people are doing is, so Marcus Ezra, the first one, so he's not really sort of active anymore, but I found find some of his music somewhere, and it's a perfect example of it. He's taken clips of Maasai women singing, and he's sampled it into his electronic dance music. And so, um, it's, he doesn't know what they're saying, he doesn't know where this music was used, but it sounded good, and he thought it would serve. He wanted, it, well, he wanted it to contribute to his, his Kenyan sound. And so... Uh, so he wants to do that. And then the other person that I talked to was Suraj, who's he's the sort of one on the far left. But actually, this, uh, this was, I thought this was an interesting poster because it has Suraj, who's this sampler. Tetu, who I talked to, I mentioned earlier with his Chekuchi, Chekuti. And Abaki Simba, who are a, a drum group who I heard described as playing drums from every tribe in Kenya. And so they are sort of another one of these groups who sort of integrates different rhythms from around. Um, Kenya and different like drums with different physical physical drums as well play a lot at the national theatre. Um, but for Suraj, he says it's never about the tribe; it's about the place in general. It's something that complements my vibe and my sound, and then we can take it basically. So it's for him; he is not necessarily doesn't know where the samples that he's using are come from coming from. But he he as a well, first generation Kenyan he talks about how this, he's using music which is from his, um, from the soundscape, like the soundscape of home is how he describes it. And so he feels like, it's an, he, feels like he wants to use these sounds and also emphasized the point that he thought was really important that Africans should be sampling music because so often it's a foreigner who comes in and just takes these sounds just because they sound good and puts it into their electronic dance music and, um, and then maybe credits it wrong or gets the context wrong and something like that. And no, I couldn't quite see how it, was a little, how it was different, how he was doing it. But for him, it was very different because he, he is a Kenyan and he's borrowing these different sounds from around Kenya. And I guess in some ways, it's kind of similar to how people are doing it at the national music festivals. There's not necessarily anybody involved who's actually from that ethnic group, but still we're gonna present this music and we're gonna, like, we're gonna represent Kenya and build up this sort of nationalism of Kenya around it. But of course, sort of something that he emphasizes is very important to, to credit the music properly. And so you say who this, this community is, like, like where they're from and what the music is. Um, and interestingly, actually, and this is kind of an aside, he's building a, a sample bank from signs from around Kenya for African artists who want to make their um, house music with African samples. And um, yeah, so the, for him, the idea is that he will sort of go to different places and record sounds, and then when people want to 
he, at one point he said it was free, and at another point he said you have to pay. So I'm not, I think they haven't quite worked out the logistics. But it's a case that so you have to, um, you can use these different sample signs from around Kenya, and then you pay some money, and it goes back to the community. And so I'm interested to see how that will work out. Yeah. So this is yeah, a very explicit sort of context in which you take something like completely out of context and you put it into dance music. But it is very much, it's another place in which people are using this idea of this traditional music and they're very much, they're negotiating their Kenyan identities through it, definitely. And while it's, people will seem very critical of this, and people were critical of this that were not critical of something like Tetu was doing with his taking, worked in Tech Chikache and Isikuti or Sauti Sol, who were actually, I guess, so I haven't quite decided what, what exactly um, rhythms they're using for their music, but they're um, dancing a, isikuti, a version of Isikuti dance. You have to talk to Kithi more about this. This is her. Yeah. Um, so finally, I'm going to look at the audience. And so the people who are, this is, who, who is listening to this music, right? So we started with Sarabi. Because Sarabi, who, who, as I said, they don't sing in, they only sing in Swahili and English. Sarabin. I really like Sarabi, which is maybe maybe typical of the sort of the audience that they have actually. So um, they describe themselves as we see ourselves like a voice for the people, whereby we, we voice the need of the people, and that's they with these songs about um, about the informal economy, unemployment for youth, about ineffective political systems, about um, corruption in the police and in government. Um, so they see it's it's very important music in terms of social commentary. But ultimately, most of the, they seem to be better known outside of Kenya than inside. And a lot of their music is for, not for expats, it's for everyone. Um, but it's listened to by expats, and like they're big outside of Kenya. So they played it, they're apparently the only East African artists who have ever played at Roskilde Festival in Denmark. And this is like one of the biggest festivals in the world. Um, um, yeah, whereas when they're playing here in Nairobi, because oh, they're well established, um, they say they've played at every venue in Nairobi like three times. Um, but a lot of the time they're playing in places like Alliance Frances, Go Down Arts Center, Alchemist, these are like just some examples, um, which have, when you go, and I'm sure you all have been, you notice like the audience is maybe like, it's maybe a little bit expensive to go in. Um, they're in places like Westlands, Lavington, um, where the Generally, the the population is sort of like better well off, um, and also many expats there as well. Which is, I mean, there's no problem with that. But it's just in terms, just have to be aware that this is the people that this kind of music is catering for, um, and if that's especially traditional music. And um, so some people describe that to me as uh, expats. They want something exotic. They want something a bit African. They're here in Nairobi, and so that's what they want to listen to. And actually, when I was talking to Kayamba Africa, so I asked them, so what do you play when you're playing for an international audience? They say, oh, we always sing Jambo Buana. Presumably, you know, in this song. And so that's for, and it's because that's what they want. They know that's the African song, so that's what they always play, which to me just seems like perpetuating that. But, um, so, um, yeah, so that's why me trying to find out. So why are these the audience? So 
um, Daniel Onyango, he says that he is often invited just to represent traditional Kenyan music rather than as an artist in his own right. And so he, he was sort of angry at that a little bit. And it's something that I mentioned earlier with Sauti Sol is that maybe traditional music, uh, traditional artists um, are often... So it's still seen a little bit as sort of backwards a little bit, so it's sort of lazy, just kind of playing around in a pub, scraping away at a soda bottle. Like it's not actually proper music that should be valued in the way that we have this, like this commercial, um, technologically sophisticated international music. And so maybe that's something only that that's um, I don't know. Anyway, I don't know. Um, so it's something he said as well as like as traditional music, he does he doesn't get girls in the way that um, these big international artists do. He's, um, and also the other thing is that mainstream media doesn't play it. And that's something that I came across from several different people they are quite angry about, is that like, the mainstream radio channels were not playing his music. And so, um, it, and so he said, so why do you think people don't want to listen to it? He's like, no, it's not that people don't want to listen to it. It's just like what the people who choose, like the radio DJs, the people who choose who to put, which artists to, to book for events, they think that people wouldn't want it. And so it's more about how big your name is than it is about the type of music that you're playing. So Saudi Soul, they're so, like, they're so famous now, they can play whatever they want, they can sing whatever language they want, but for us we have to sort of make an effort to be sort of sound more like the mainstream sound, and what that means is not using these traditional rhythms or sounds. Um, yeah, and, and all of them, with this kind of audience, like all of them are aware that this is problematic, but it seems like difficult to know what to do about it, especially if these are the places where you're asked to play and that's the audience for it. Yeah. And then, so the last little comment from that was um, Irosh saying that, well, the audience in some venues, they know how to separate politics from their music. And so what that means is, um, yeah, they're not going to attack him as a... or be critical of him as a Kikuyu singing Kikuyu music because that's he's trying to make people and making people proud to be a Kikuyu whereas in other spaces he could be criticized for that in this survey. We're supposed to sort of depoliticize tribal identity or something like that. And so which actually kind of brings us to the start, um, back to the start and to the comment on the music festivals in which, uh, which I heard at the music festivals in which there, there's, there's no tribalism here, that's only for politicians and actually so music is sort of somehow depoliticized again, although that, of course the music festivals is for, for a much wider audience. So in conclusion, um, there, is, there is no unified Kenyan sound, yeah, and except I guess maybe Chikacha, although that's my future research, if Chikacha has become the Kenyan sound for people who are sampling or using traditional sounds from Kenya. Um, and then when it comes to tradition itself, like the decontextualization and the depoliticization of ethnicities into a, like a national forum at places like the national music festivals, it maybe makes for this Kenyan identity through multiplicity. And it doesn't, although that multiplicity doesn't necessarily allow for creative expression and contemporary identities, especially at places like the um, music festivals and sort of particularly for modern urban youth who feel like they have to do it in other ways from that like traditional, traditional sense, which is something that's rarefied. But in the meantime, there's a, like this huge amount of creative expression here in Nairobi and like more and more places all the time to encounter it and to see it. And I've really enjoyed doing this research partly because of that, just there's so much music going on and so many people who are like very self-aware about what they're doing and yeah, encouraging each other to make more music. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Phoebe, for that lovely presentation. I will now open up the floor for questions. Uh, who'd like to go first? Benja? Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I would like to understand if um, you got any answer from your interviews. What do they mean by contemporary music? Because, for example, in the... In the quote from when you were talking about Salty Soul, mm -hmm. in the quote comparing like them to, for example, Whiskey, mm. so the genre of what Whiskey does can be defined as Afrobeats. And um, in my experience, Afrobeat seems to be very much a West African kind of majorly influenced West African product. Mm. Um, so I wonder if when they say contemporary, they mean Afrobeat or they mean, I don't know, um, 
uh, a Western influence, so like uh, you mentioned, for example, American songs playing on the radio. Mm -hmm. What do they mean by that? Oh, yeah. it's, a, it's a good question, actually, because it's true. I've been exploring what people mean by traditional, but not necessarily by contemporary. I don't think they mean Afrobeats. I don't think they want it to sound like WizKid. Um, but, and a lot of people describe their music as Afrofusion. And I think what they mean by that, other, other people rejected it because it's like way too broad uh, a label for anything. Um, but I think how people describe it is using um, contemporary instruments. I think the way I use it is a little bit differently. Maybe it's like music, for me it's like music that's used in the present. Um, and like it's just maybe a more way to just think about how people are producing music and using all these different things in the present. In the same way I would say the tradi traditional music which is being produced now is also contemporary. So that's maybe, but that's not maybe not how many of them would use it. Um, somebody said to me, Oh, this, of course, you, you, can't, you can never have traditional music because as soon as you mic up your nyatiti, it's going to be contemporary. And so that's another way of thinking about it, is any sort of elec like digitization or any type of um, new technologies involved in it. So that's one answer to that. But yeah, as I said, so for me, it's just any music that's produced in contemporary times. I think for other people, it's something that they can feel like they can... Uh, bring in other influences and they don't have to be restricted in something that's trying to be faithful to a village kind of identity, maybe, I don't know. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, that was very interesting, Phoebe. Um, <clears throat> I took the mic because my question was related to what Benja has just asked about contemporary and, um, and traditional music. To me, I don't see a clear distinction mm. between both. Mm. And so when you talk about instruments, that makes more sense to me mm. than, um, than the music itself. Because dance, like when we're looking at Kayamba, Africa, no, 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 uh, South Soul, mm. it's all about Lipara. Is it called Lipara? You know, the way they were dancing yeah. and the moves and everything is about traditional mm. or I don't know. I don't want to call it traditional because yeah. I was wondering if this is more about um, evolution hmm. of what we are calling traditional to more uh, current times or whatever because it can also remain the way it was from the beginning. Hmm. So it's more of um, maybe instruments that they are using yeah. Yeah. than, than, than the, the, um, the music itself per se. And then my, my other question was about chakacha. Uh, for me, I guess chakacha is a dance. So uh, how do you define chakacha? And also, uh, what, what are the characteristics of, of benga? Yeah? How would I listen to a tune and say this is benga? Okay. Or this is chakacha? Chakacha to me, more of it is more about, um, about moves than, I don't know, than a genre. Okay. Well, I'll begin with those, those later questions because that's maybe a little bit easier. Um, for Chikacha, again, I mean, this, is, this is not exactly what my research was on, but I've, I mean, I've heard different things. Um, Chikacha, what I've, what I've heard, it's uh, in 12.8, so this di 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 and I don't know exactly what the, like, the beat pattern that falls in it. So yeah, if, yes, it is a dance, but with all of these, I think it's difficult to separate the dance and the music itself, because often music was always danced to, and it has these particular forms that you dance it to. Um, so like in, in, in Kiswahili, or in Swahili, you have the word ngoma. That maybe describes it better, actually. Like, it, it's not... It's not a dance and it's not music, it's not something that you separate. We have a similar thing in Scottish, in Scotland actually. Kaylee, it's, it's not just dance, it's not just music. And so that's, yeah, I mean, I, I'm more specifically looking at music here, but it could also be dance that you're, you're looking at. Does that, yeah, make sense for Chikacha? Um, for Benga, characteristics of Benga, I might have to um, refer that question to someone else, but it's, I know that it has, uh, like, guitar is, like, heavily used, and then some kind of percussion, like, kereyengerenga, or something. Um, and then, mm, no, I don't feel like I'm an authority yet. I can speak on this. But, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll do some research, and I'll get back to you on that one. Um, but in terms of um, your question on 
traditional and contemporary. And I think it's a really interesting way to think about it in terms of like evolution. Um, I'm not sure if I would describe it like that, because especially how some of these people that are sort of very self-aware about it, they're sort of referencing something that's was traditional, and yes, it is adapting, and the way we saw it at the National Music Festivals, in which people are are watching the videos of last year, and so it's always going to change little bits, and then sort of last year becomes the source, instead of 100 years ago becomes the source. It's, yeah, I guess it's going to change, but at the same time, people are trying to make these efforts for to sort of incorporate something that was from a long time ago, then, and sort of it's, it's more like a loop. I think I'm not sure if I would think about it as teleological evolution. Um, I think I think it's about the songs. If you go to the traditional, yeah, whatever, at the at music festivals, mm. it's about the songs. They sing the songs that were sung then. Mm. Um, so it's it's an old song probably that is being referred in this case as traditional. Mm. And also uh, they probably use drums, only drums, and not the more the more contemporary uh, uh, music instruments. Mm -hmm. So, um, but songs keep changing. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So if it's about song, then you want new songs come up. I don't know if that would qualify the whole thing to be called either traditional uh. or, tem or contemporary. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, and so I think, and um, yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and of course, there's there's no such thing as this reified traditional thing which never changes. And so, the, I think the way the reason I continue to use it is because it was a concept that people kind of kept using. So yes, we are using traditional music. We are using chikachi rhythms, or we are using isikuti dance, or something. And so it's a way of referring to something that uh, one of the influences for the music. And of course, it's only one of the influences. They have all these other influences as well. Um, and it's something. So they have. Yeah, a way of describing one of these influences, which is rooted in some kind of ethnic or um, like historical background. Yeah, but at the same time, yeah, it's all changing, and it's <laughs> and in terms of contemporary, like I'm not sure if I would. Okay, I'm describing a particular uh, moment in music in Nairobi here with the different artists that I've talked to and what's happening at the music festivals now. But I'm sure you can look back at what's happening now in 50 years' time, and you'll say, oh, they were in this particular moment, and it's it's no longer the contemporary. It's it's doing something. It's a, yeah, maybe it's the post moi era. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, so about Benga music, I asked my office mates actually, like, do you guys know what Benga music is? And everyone had a different definition. So I think in terms of like understanding traditional culture and traditional music, I don't know, I think people in Kenya don't have the identity of like, you know, what is Kenyan identity and what is Kenyan music. So I was going to ask you to define Benga music, but you already answered that you don't know, so I'm not going to ask you. Um, I think my other question is also, you said people are critical of, I guess, musicians sampling um, traditional music. And I'm just wondering, like, who are these people who are critical? Because Kenyan Musk would not be critical, I think, I don't know. Um, and is it fair also to have Kenyan musicians be critical or problematize their own music? I mean, how is that in terms of like, you know, in, in, in the West, I think you can expect, expect people to be critical, but mm. it's because it's a tradition of like thinking about things and, you know, pro, um, appropriation, for instance, people talk a lot about appropriation, but in Kenya, we're not quite there. And I don't know if I'm unfairly also mm. assuming that Kenyans cannot think critically. Um, but like, yeah, is it, is it fair really to expect people to problematize? sampling of traditional music? Yeah, I would say first, and it's something, yeah, okay, another thing for me to do in my research is I haven't talked to many of, like, the mainstream public about what they, they have think about these things. And um, so when I'm talking about who's critical, it's mostly the artists, the other artists who I've talked to. And so that's, it's maybe a little bit of sort of finger pointing, like, that person's, we're doing it better than those people, sort of thing, maybe. Um, but at the same time, so I rush, uh, Suraj himself, who, um, who I talked to about this, he, he said, oh, I think there's... N was it? Um, yeah, no, no, it must be someone else actually. Said, um, 
Well, one of the other artists who was critical of Suraj, who's sampling, he says, oh, but there's not enough music that's being produced in, in um, Kenya at the moment. And so, yeah, and so we need, we need more music to be produced. And so, yeah, it's true. Yeah, why should we, people be critical about all this? Yeah, we just need to produce more and more and more. And so, and then you have more, more inspiration and more things going on. So, yeah, but at the same time, and... I could, you could level exactly those criticisms at other people. So, like, so the people at Kayamba Africa, for example, they were critical of the people who were sampling because they say it's decontextualized, they, they don't know what it means, they've not done their research properly. Whereas then I've heard those criticisms kind of being used about Kayamba Africa and their music as well, and that it's decontextualized and you've put a new beat to it. And so I think it's in, to some extent it's just a case of people just sort of pointing fingers at everyone else 